Well, good evening, everybody. And I know this is evening from, for us, but maybe somebody here is watching from another uh, place in another country. And so we're here. My name is Larry Ward, and we're here at Be Law Live. And uh, our goal here at uh, Be Law Live is to encourage, to inspire, and also to educate, uh, sharing different subject matters and stories that will encourage people in their faith and their walk with God, and as well as uh, helping you to do life better. And so today, um, we are here to talk about the public health uh, as in this uh, pandemic situation of COVID and how it has really been a, a real um, struggle for many. And we wanna talk to uh, Lauren DePass, Anson DePass, she's here today and she's a newlywed. And we wanna say congratulations to Lauren. And I just wanna give you a little bit about her bio and her background um, with the subject of uh, public health. So Lauren um, is uh, serving at, at the is she's associate at the Health Resources in Action at the Public Health Institute in Boston. Uh, her passion includes uh, child and adolescent health and substance use prevention, uh, maternal health outcomes, and racial and health equality or equity. Um, she also has earned her bachelor's of science degree in sociology at the Boston University. And she also has a master's degree in public health in urban health at Northeastern U University in Boston. Uh, Lauren has provided technical assistance and training, and she also has uh, provided leadership on many different projects and focused on substance use and prevention mm -hmm. and violence prevention, school health and uh, maternal health outcomes and community mobilization, including helping us as uh, a church, Abundant Life Church, uh, participate in the All Flavors Initiative. And so uh, glad to be here with, with Lauren. I'm a pastor and, and so it's a delight to know that uh, she is out there really making a difference in the area of public health. So welcome Lauren, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Super excited to be here with y'all. Good to see you. Well, so uh, I'm just gonna start right in. Uh, so tell me about your journey into the field of public health. Yeah, totally. So I think what's interesting for me, I definitely did not know it was a field before I got into it. And I'm definitely happy to talk to folks who have interest in it. Um, I think it's a it's a really profound field to be in, I think, if you're someone like me. So I guess I'll explain that. So I went to college, like a lot of folks. Uh, I was pre-med biology. Actually, I was biology with a specialization in cell bio and genetics, like very intense bio. Um, and I was spending a lot of time in the lab. And I think I'm someone who really likes reading. I'm like thinking, I'm like asking questions. And so I was kind of looking for a space to, to do that. Um, and as a part of my uh, undergraduate degree, I had to take a sociology class and I ended up taking sociology of race and ethnicity. Um, and that class, and I'll say this slightly, it really changed my life. Um, it was in that class that I realized a lot of things I had experienced lived in a much greater context, that they weren't things that I had just experienced, but they were experiences of lots of other people. And that those experiences are connected to our health and how healthy we can be and things that help contribute to health. And so it became really fascinating for me to think about um, the, the diseases and the things that I was learning in my biology classes and the ways those things connected to the society that we lived in, you know, and so what's interesting about health is health doesn't occur in a vacuum, right? You aren't sick outside of your reality, right? Your reality plays a huge role into how you feel, what resources you have access to, how you connect to a provider, um, and why or why, uh, the reasons why you may or may not be getting healthier. Um, and so sociology really began to make me think critically about why are people sick? Not what are they sick with, but what is making folks sick? Um, and so, uh, public health is kind of this merge of, of like social, the social sciences and medicine. We ask those questions a lot, right? We, we talk a lot about what makes people healthy or not healthy. And so medicine looks at individual experiences and provider sees one person, but public health folks think about populations of people. So why is this neighborhood sick? Why is this, um, this country, this city, this ethnic group of people experiencing these health outcomes? Um, and so we think really critically about how 
your social circumstances affect that or don't affect that, right? How does your family structure contribute to that? How does your neighborhood, how does the air quality you have affect those things? And then public health thinks a lot about, so what structures or policies or systems, uh, resources, programs actually are going to make, give you the best opportunity to have the, the most positive health outcomes. Um, and so that's what we spend a lot of time thinking about. And I think I like it a lot as a person of faith because I think a lot about how do we honor all people and helping folks live their healthiest lives for me is how I love to honor people. Um, it's hard for me to imagine someone being able to really live out the fullness of the purpose of God when they're sick or they're not well or they're struggling with an addiction, right? And so helping folks have access to whatever they need to be able to thrive um, is how I really love to honor people. Wow, it it's really it sounds very interesting how how those two of sociology and public health have merged together. Um, so that thank you for that. That's a that's a really clear explanation. So I, I just didn't know how how it worked together, but <laughs> yeah, totally. It's, it's amazing. Um, so so when we're talking about public health, um, there there are many voices that are out there and have been. Uh, talking about how do we um, protect ourselves uh, during this uh, season, in this critical season of COVID-19. Um, and so during this time, you're hearing a lot of these voices. We're hearing voices from our, the White House to the infectious disease specialist and, and experts. We're hearing from our local government. Um, and we're now seeing, I was just watching um, CNN and uh, they had uh, the mayor of Wichita run there who was actually being threatened. Um, and he was actually being threatened, his life was threatened. Um, and they caught the gentleman that, that was threatening his life because he was telling him to wear a mask. Um, and now you have all this stuff going on where um, just the infectious disease folks are now saying one thing and you're hearing another thing mm -hmm. what what's going on in the public health what's what's happening with that yeah that's a really great question i, I think I've, I've been thinking about this a lot actually covid is so unique to us so most folks i say have never lived through a pandemic right and a pandemic is when you have a, a disease or virus spread that's global right there are epidemics that happen all the time measles polio ebola lisi pops up epidemics are very are regional or community oriented disease spread um and then there are also what we call like a social epidemic or a social pandemic maybe like racism or um, poverty right some folks will make that argument but what's interesting about COVID-19 is it's, this is not like measles so it's not like a disease or a virus that we actually know a lot about we're learning a lot of things live and so what we knew about COVID-19 is very now is very different than what we knew in March right that's that's a really wild experience that most of us really haven't lived through and so I think that's the first thing that makes it really confusing is that tomorrow they may find out something completely new that we didn't know today so that's that's I think is really difficult I think the second thing that makes it really difficult is we have somehow politicized a virus in the United States in ways that other folks have not and so and I think that's very strategic from this administration and folks may have their feelings and that's fine about the administration. But I, I think um, the politicizing the virus, right, is really actually setting up how folks respond, their health behaviors in alignment to a political party. That's really wild, actually. We don't talk about the flu like this. We don't talk about like allergies like this, but we are talking about a really serious disease that we don't know a whole lot about like this. And so that makes it even trickier to think about what voices do I listen to because we tend to listen to voices that align with our political party or our, our, our beliefs in that sense. Um, and so that's also really wild. And I find really frustrating for folks in public health because um, this means that clear information doesn't always get out in a time where information is already difficult to get out because everything is so new. So I think those things definitely make um, it trickier. And I think what also another layer to add is that our political leaders, as they're making recommendations and decisions, I think a lot of them do it based on public health data, but they also have other interests that they have to keep in mind as they're making those recommendations. So they have to keep in mind their lobbyists or the economic and business community, right? There are folks in their ears who are saying, well, you need to reopen because I da 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 da. 
Um, and so those aren't things we see in the same way with like the chicken box. Um, and so I think that's another layer that makes it difficult. So in light of your question, I think, I think about who do I listen to? Um, so the first, I think the first like body that I listen to, I tend to listen to the CDC and I have a lot of respect for the CDC and, and I still kind of have to take the, what they say with a grain of salt because they are under this administration, right? And he has his hand in kind of what comes out. And so I do find the CDC tries to be as accurate as possible. And I think what's new is what they say has changed. So in Mar when this first happened in March, they're telling folks not to buy masks, right? And then the new best practice that came out where we should wear masks. And I think that was really difficult for folks. And I think the reality is that we haven't had a disease like this before that's affected such a, uh, like a whole population that keeps the information we hear keeps changing. Um, I also really pay attention to the World Health Organization and I pay a lot of attention as to how folks respond in other countries. Um, and so when things were really bad in New York and things were bad in Italy and Spain, what we used to talk about a lot at work is that it looks like Italy is a few weeks ahead of New York and we're about a week ahead and Boston about a week ahead of New York. So we're kind of using those countries and their response as a way to track what was working and what was not working. And I find that helpful because they aren't bound to the same political interests and ties that we are, right? They're making decisions differently. And I would say that every government body deals with that in some sort of way. Um, but it kind of gives me more data to look at when I'm looking at what's happening across the world. So why is, why are African countries overall doing much better, right? Why is Europe and Spain, how are folks responding that makes things better? And so those are, that's kind of what I've been tracking. Um, I also really listen a lot to what healthcare workers who've been working with COVID patients say. And I think that gave me a lot of perspective before. So I used to live across the street from a nurse and we were good friends and she was, she was working in the intensive care unit and was saying, this isn't a joke. Like what's happening in patients is wild. We've never seen anything like this before. We're using more resources than we've had before. And so hearing her perspective, right, I think in light of some of the commentary that folks had really also was giving me um, more light as to how serious COVID was. Um, but I will also say, I think in Massachusetts, I, I will say, I think, um, in comparison to a lot of other states, I feel like Massachusetts has done pretty a pretty solid job in terms of being really conservative with their reopening and, and being really conservative in, in terms of how we should do things. And I think when you're in a space where you really don't know a lot about a virus, that's how you have to respond, right? We don't know if it's really safe to reopen, so we're going to kind of hold back for a little while and see if it's actually safe. And so I pay a lot of attention to what uh, Department of Public Health or DPH says, and they track statewide data. And I think um, they've done a pretty good job of being explicit it daily with the numbers, with what's happening. And that's kind of been helpful for me to, to think about how um, things are evolving. But I think in all, the reality is COVID's been around roughly since December, but in the U.S. and an issue really since about March. I think that's when we start really tracking data around it. That's not a lot of time in the data world to really think about a disease or to track trends. Like about six months isn't a long time. And so I think that's something that I feel like folks also have to kind of be aware of. We don't really have a lot of data that we would like to really make really good explanations or some good hypotheses about what we're seeing. Um, and that's just because we're really early into this pandemic. Well, it, so when it comes to all of the, the data and all the voices that are, you know, talking about what we should do to keep ourselves safe, and I'm glad for it, um, I'm listening to the same voices that you mentioned from CDC to my local authority. And I have to make decisions on how we're going to open or not open or how long it's going to be open, uh, opportunity to open the church. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I'm, I'm trying to keep my ear to the ground on mm -hmm. this one as well. Mm -hmm. But what concerns me is that I'm seeing an uptick. I'm, uh, you know, we, we have been uh, social distancing. We have been wearing our mask and we're seeing this uptick again of cases, um, and now globally we're like, what, 40 million? Um, mm -hmm. And we're over 200,000 uh, deaths in the United States alone. Um, and people uh, are just, you know, some are just kind of doing their mask and some people are still not doing their mask. Mm -hmm. um, so in one particular group that, you know, 
they're focusing on is the, the younger generation, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps your generation, uh, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily wearing the mask or they're going to parties. And I can't say it's just millennials because we're seeing, you know, folks in high offices going to- Yes, we, yes, we are. And so it's not, it's not just you, but what would you say to your generation um, who maybe, you know, they just really want to get out. They're just tired of being, you know, in, in just the social distancing mode and they really want to get out and be together. Uh, what, what would you try to tell them now in this moment of uptick mm -hmm. about helping our society and helping other people in themselves be responsible for protecting ourselves? And yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think about that in two parts. Right? I think I am like, a, a, I would say like a closet researcher. I tend to ask researchy ask questions, right? And so um, when I think about upticks, my question is, well, why is there an uptick? And why is there an uptick in specific groups of people? Um, and part of that, right, the hard part is I was looking through today, and at least in Massachusetts, they're supposed to be doing a deep dive because they're seeing this uptick in young people and trying to figure out what that actually means, right? Is it a specific group of young people? Is it working young people? Like, what does that mean? Um, and so the first thing that I started thinking about, because I'll say numbers always live in context, um, is that... Um, young people may be doing things that put us at greater risk for exposure. And so that could mean like we're, we're doing parties and things at our houses and we shouldn't be doing that. But it could also mean that we may be the ones in our families who are more likely to go to the grocery store or to go into work, right? And so there also may be some other um, responsibilities or things that young people are doing that we wouldn't, cons we wouldn't think about maybe as risky, risky behavior, but they're doing it because they're the younger person in the household or the more able-bodied person in the household. Um, but I, I think too, and I think like you said, right, we're seeing uh, super spreader events happen in the White House, right? And that being a model for folks, um, we're seeing super spreader or events where folks, or there's like a lot of transmission of disease happening very quickly in weddings and funerals um, and prisons and nursing homes. So there are all these kind of spaces. I think with young people, what I would say, and actually for people in general, is that this is an awful time, right? Like being in a pandemic is not fun. And it's very isolating for people. And even when I have conversations with my friends, I can hear, and myself included, how the toll that's really taking on folks. Um, and the more I talk to mental health folks, the more they're like, that's very normal for an experience like this to just really be very trying on someone. Um, COVID has taken away, I think, a coping mechanisms that a lot of folks use to be healthy. So maybe seeing friends or going to the gym or doing things in person that might have actually been helpful. They don't have access to those things. So in some sense, like I totally see the struggle. Right. And I think there's this like grasp for some sort, something that feels normal, something that feels like it's been. Um, and so I think there's that piece for sure. This is this is a very difficult time period. And so what I would say to folks um, is to try and find ways to experience community. Cause that's what it, I think that's what it kind of boils down to. Folks are looking for so, like connection. Folks are looking for things that feel normal, right? Um, so look for opportunities to engage in community in ways that are safe. And so maybe instead of having a party at your house, you have a party in your backyard that's socially distanced and maybe you're all sitting around, a, uh, you know, like a fire pit, right? So you can have those connections in your master on but you're able to actually be safe because I understand the desire to connect with folks. Um, I would also say something I think about a lot, even when I talked to, I had a lot of friends who've gotten married in, in the last uh, six months or so. There's this sense of, I only need to do the bare minimum of the regulations that exist, right? And I hear that a lot from people. So if it says that we can only have 50 people, it's fine if I have 50 people. And that, that should be safe. And I, and I think like there's this sense of like, well, if that's the minute, if that's what they're saying, that must be okay. And, and what I would say is there are a lot of places, um, and I know not necessarily Massachusetts, but across the country, right, who have bars open, who have clubs open and say it's fine. That doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. And I think that's really confusing because you should be able to trust that your local government is making decisions about reopening that are safe for you. Um, but I definitely have seen a lot of people in Florida and in Georgia going into bars in whores with no masks and there's no enforcement of safety. And so 
I think what I've had to explain to folks, uh, a lot of my friends and a lot of my family members who aren't in public health is just because something is reopened, that doesn't mean that the activity is safe. And that can be really confusing right now for folks. And so what I do personally is I'm pretty conservative about what I'm doing and who I'm with. Because just because the movie theater is open and I want to go see a movie, I'd love to be at the movie, it doesn't mean it's actually safe for me to be there. Um, and so I really, I would encourage people to think very critically and very conservatively about who they're around. If they're actually distanced, folks are wearing masks. I see people in the grocery store, not socially distanced with masks, you know, here or at their chin. And I'm kind of like, well, what's the point of that, right? Um, so to really kind of be critical about those things because the spaces that we're in where those those things should be enforced, oftentimes aren't, aren't enforced. Um, and our governments may actually not be enforcing reopening that's safe for the place that we're in. Um, and so I would be critical about, about that and thinking about that. Um, and then I would still, like really be diligent. And what I tell myself is that we're not going to be in this space forever. And that feels hard to believe at times, but I tell myself at some point, we're not going to have to wear masks every day. We're not going to have to be socially distanced and it may be longer than I want it to be, but we will not be here forever. Um, and so to be able to remind myself and set expectations of this likely isn't going to be December. It's likely not going to be next March. It could be farther than that out, but it won't be like this forever. I think it's something that helps me think about it um, and not feel like, well, my only option is to kind of forget that the virus doesn't exist and do what I want to do, right? Because I know that's actually not good for me or good for other people. Well, thank you. That, that really is a a good explanation of, and also how you think about it, which, which prompted me as you were talking. I know this is kind of a, another question I had just kind of <laughs> off the cuff, right? Yeah, totally. What, what you're talking about. Um, as, you, as your hopes and your expectations are, are looking forward to the time where we won't have to wear a mask, we won't have to social distance ourselves as we're doing right now. Um, we know that they're talking about vaccines and they're saying vaccines are going to probably be st starting to come out in October or just before the election. We only got a couple of weeks, maybe what, 13 days or so from counting it uh, before the election. And now we're, we're, we're looking forward to having a vaccine, but of course the vaccine is not going to be able to be available for the general public. But how long, how, how long is it, is it till an, a vaccine becomes available to the general public and what is going to give the confidence that someone is going to actually get it so that we can really feel safe enough and secure enough to take a mask off? Yep. So <laughs> if you listen to our administration, it'll be available before the election. I think that's highly unlikely. Um, I've read things that it could be as far out as 2022 before it could be available to all people. Um, I think what's hard about this vaccine, and, and I'll say this, I think I was reading a few months ago, I think they did a similar thing with SARS. They were rushing to get this vaccine. And sometimes this happens, not all the time. SARS kind of ended up dying out on its own, right? I'm not necessarily saying that could happen with COVID. I, don't, I definitely don't want to say that, but it, that can happen with the virus. Um, so- Oh, wait, wait, hold the thought. Why not? Okay. What's, what, what was the difference between the SARS and COVID. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't so know. <laughs> SARS, I think, I think it's the biology of the virus itself. And so viruses, so the reason actually why we get a new flu shot every year is because viruses mutate every year to, to stay liable. So viruses aren't like bacteria in the sense that you can get an antibiotic that kills the bacteria and it's over. When folks get a flu, there's no like flu antibiotic. You have to let the, the flu run its course. That's really how viruses work. You have to let the virus run its course. And so as viruses spread in a population, they can mutate still. And sometimes they mutate to become less severe. Um, and they do that as a way to to spread faster, like there's a lot of like evolutionary like virus growth and stuff kind of into that. But it's not uncommon for viruses to mutate but they don't always do that. Um, and so it is possible the virus could mutate and become less severe. I don't know if that's really where we're going right now. So I, I don't want, definitely don't want to say that, um, but every virus is different. And so I think the reality is there's a, there's a couple pieces at play with the vaccine. So 
So one, the rush to get the vaccine, I think, is making a lot of people uncomfortable, myself included, um, that vaccines have to go through clinical trials to make sure that they're safe. And those clinical trials take a long time. And so rushing that process definitely makes me feel a little nervous about how safe that vaccine, how effective it, that is. It could be incredibly safe. It could be completely safe. Those are my personal hesitations. Um, I think on the other side, right, especially people of color, really have had a history of, of being experimented on in terms of new developments. And so I hear from a lot of Black people specifically a lot of hesitation around getting the vaccine. And I think that has a lot of, there's a lot of historical evidence to support that kind of fear and anxiety that... Um, and Tuskegee is the one that we go to most regularly, but there, there are hundreds of years of those kind of experimentations on, on Black people, on people of color, on Native people. And so I think there's hesitation in that sense as well. Um, and so how long could it take for the vaccine to come out? I, to be honest, I don't know. I, I would be very shocked if it was available in October, like within the next three weeks before the election. That sounds really crazy to me. Um, I've heard folks say sometime next year, but I, I would be, I would not be surprised, right, if people didn't get it. And and so what I also say is that vaccines don't protect populations; vaccinations protect po protect populations. So it doesn't. We see outbreaks of measles and whooping cough because people choose not to vaccinate children, and so. I'm someone who's very pro-vaccines. I think vaccines are awesome, but I think the way that this vaccine has been developed and how rapidly it's been developed and the kind of political motivations around the development of the vaccine are what personally make me nervous. So the long and short of it is I don't think anyone really knows when they're gonna be available. I was reading recently that one of the companies had to stop their clinical trials because one of the patients had a poor response. And so, but there are several companies working on vaccines right now as well. And so, Long and short of it, I don't think anyone knows. I think people keep making predictions, but I think they're just I think they're just predictions. Wow. That's very informative. Thank you. That's that's very informative. because uh, I always wanted to find out what you felt about vaccines and what, what I'm really to think about it. So when it when it comes to COVID-19, um, a lot of changes have happened from the business world to church. Mm -hmm. and, and the like. Um, so how do you think COVID-19 is going to change the way public health is done in the future? That's a great question. So what's interesting is I think, so public health, depending on where you are, can either be really valued or like, like kind of on the back burner. It's not, it's not valuable. I think Massachusetts is a, is a place where public health is really valued. And we see that in the fact that we pretty much have almost everyone here covered by health insurance and that mass health is like actually a really great insurance. To be on. If I could be on mass health, I totally would be. Um, and so I think what's interesting when it first started, the conversations that I was having with my colleagues a lot was that COVID was really highlighting things that we've been talking about in public health for a while that a lot of folks didn't really pay any mind to. So we were saying things like housing is actually something that's pretty like pretty unstable for a lot of people. If you miss a few paychecks, you don't have housing, you don't have housing. It's you're at a risk for lots of other poor health outcomes because housing provides a lot of things for people, safety, physical safety, but probably safety from relationships. It gives you access to things, things to being good housing. So there are those kind of things. COVID also has really highlighted um, racial inequities that we've been talking about in public health. So at the beginning, the CDC was not tracking uh, COVID outcomes by race, only by socioeconomic status. And a lot of physicians and public health folks were really upset about that because that's not how we look at data. We need to see actually a whole game of data to see how people are affected and how we can support folks. And as after that is when we found out that Black people, Native people were experiencing these really much more severe outcomes from COVID-19. And it's not because there's something genetically different about us. Race is a social construct. It doesn't exist biologically, but it is very real in its consequences. Um, and so people of color are much more likely to be working jobs where we are high risk for exposure. We had less outcome, we had less likelihood to have stable transportation or access to health resources. So the things that could have protected us and protected folks from exposure or managing if we did get COVID-19 
2019 we didn't have. And so um, one of the things that I think has been really valuable is folks are really have really woken up to, oh, our, our healthcare system actually doesn't honor people, right? It, it doesn't, doesn't really value the life of people. Right? We don't have a healthcare system that cares for folks. It's, it's actually a really wild concept that your healthcare access is connected to your job, right? You should, there are a lot of people who can't work because of their health, right? And so um, I think what it has done is actually kind of brought into light things that public health has been trying to say, that it shouldn't matter how much you make, you should have access to good healthcare, right? When people are healthy, it's actually better for our economy, it's better for our schools, it's better for like the whole gamut of society when people are actually healthy. Um, and so I think it's it's kind of shifted some priority back to public health, which has been really exciting, um, that folks are seeing, oh, this isn't just, um, like ideals or opinions, but these are things that are really grounded in data and we're seeing the consequences of it. Um, and so I think that's been helpful. It's been really exciting to hear folks having more interest in public health who didn't know it existed. Um, and so folks who didn't really know what my job were are now asking me lots of questions <laughs> and which has been really exciting. And so I think that's also been really helpful to see some interest, but there are things like telehealth that physicians and a lot of grassroots organizations have been advocating for that health insurance companies said wasn't possible that now have become part of our reality. And there are some folks who may not go back to seeing their physician in person if they can do it on telehealth. Um, and so I think some of those things have, have changed, but I, I feel like that public health in of itself, um, a lot of what's happened in COVID are things that we've been saying that folks are, are beginning to understand um, in real time. And I think at the, especially at the very beginning of COVID that seemed to be across party lines. And I thought that was actually a really powerful experience. And like in March and April, that there were folks across the political spectrum who were saying, maybe we should actually rechange, we should think about changing our healthcare system. Like maybe we should think about changing how um, employment is tied to your healthcare or access to housing has changed or access to, to transportation has changed um, because these things don't feel fair anymore. And so I think that's been really powerful for folks to, to really think more critically about equity in the ways that it doesn't just affect them, but maybe their neighbor or their whole community. So as we, as we look at public health, and I just want to just also, first of all, just welcome anybody who has come in during our conversation. We're here talking with Lauren uh, in Son de Pass, and we're talking about uh, public health and COVID. And so, so Lauren, this, this is something that I also wanted to uh, talk to you about public health as we're kind of looking at it in the services. Uh, mental health uh, is, a, is a big concern. Mm -hmm. um, that this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has really pushed people as we're isolated in many cases or we with, mm -hmm. with, have our social distancing, some are isolated, some have lost loved ones um, that they couldn't see, um, they couldn't be with them, yep. obviously. Um, depression, anxiety, um, a, lot of, a lot of folks are just having a lot of different uh, things that's going on that's really impacting their mental health. Mm -hmm. So uh, when they're talking about this need um, for more uh, mental health resources, what, what's happening when it comes to public health on that issue as it relates to mental health? Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, I think you could totally have a whole conversation on COVID and mental health um, and the ways that it's affecting people. I think just about every public health practitioner or and every mental health professional I know would say that there's never been enough mental health resources. Even before COVID, I would argue there was never enough mental health resources for folks. Um, and I think that's for several reasons. I think partly because there's stigma around mental health. I think people really um, don't recognize the connection between your mental health and the rest of your body, that your mental health can very directly affect your physical health and well-being. Um, and so those are, I think those are things. And I think too, and I say this, I think even in talking to younger children who I'm noticing in school, they're, they're, social emotional learning is a big thing and, and students are learning more about how to talk about their, their feelings and their emotional health, right? I think a lot of 
folks, and I would like my generation included, don't have a lot of language around talking about their mental health or emotional health. Um, and so there's often a lack of awareness that, oh, this thing that's happening to me isn't my, my fault, but it's not, it's actually not normal, not healthy. Um, and there's something that I can do about it to actually be healthier. Um, and so I think the hard thing with, with COVID for sure is that the disruption, right, is actually causing kind of a long-term exposure to trauma. I would definitely say this is a, a traumatic time for people, even if you haven't lost someone or haven't experienced maybe a financial crisis, if nothing major has happened, the very severe disruption to normalcy is we can consider kind of a long-term trauma exposure, right? And that naturally affects our mental health and that's very normal. And I think, um, we don't have a lot of language to talk about that. So I think that's one thing. I think especially for our young people, when I talk to young people now, it's very sad because their whole life literally has been flipped upside down and young people already have very little autonomy. And so they have even less now, right? Even more, even they're even more disconnected to folks than they were before. And so I think that's, um, that definitely makes it more difficult. I will say, at least in Massachusetts, something that has been really helpful that I've taken advantage of is that most of um, the medical insurance companies in Massachusetts have now may, are covering or waiving the copay for mental health services. So if you're seeing a, a mental health counselor or a therapist, right, you're not paying out of pocket anymore. And I, that's something I think that actually folks should really take advantage of. Um, in my experience, finding a, a therapist or a mental health counselor, right, when you're in need, right, when something really difficult has happened is really hard to do. And because there are poor, there are not a lot of resources, you may have to wait a while before you can see someone. So I would actually really encourage every person to take advantage of connecting with a mental health professional. Um, and I say that because every year we have a physical, we see our eye doctor, we see our dentist, right? We really invest in our bodies that we don't invest in our mental health and our emotional health. And that's actually really critical. Even if that person, you see them once a year or twice a year or a quarter or whatever, to have someone to check in with you, just to make sure that like your mental and emotional wellness is like really in a good place is really important. So I'll say for me, um, I started seeing, I think it was like maybe last December, I had a, or two Decembers ago, roughly about two Decembers ago, I had a, an appointment with my doctor and I was having a lot of GI issues and a lot of digestive problems. I was really sick all the time. And my doctor said to me, I could send you to your, like your gastroenterologist and they can do some tests for you. But actually the reason why you're having all these issues is because you're grieving. And like, this is how your body is physically responding. This is just like, this is really what I think. And if you really want to get to the root of the issue, you probably need to see a therapist to help you process your grief because your body is really exhibiting all these symptoms of grief is what it looks like. Um, and that was really profound for me. And that was true. And seeing a therapist, and I've seen that my same therapist for about a year and a half has been really profound in helping to recognize things in my life that maybe weren't my fault, or I was just around, or I heard, but it affected me. Um, and she to me, last week we we're talking and I said, I don't remember what I said, but she was like, it's really normal actually to, to be fearful of change when the change around you has been really negative. And so there are ways that we can actually retrain your brain to have better associations with change, but it's normal to feel this way. And it's good that you're seeing this, right? And so that's not something that I didn't physically, I never actually process like, oh, I think I fear change, but having someone who to talk through that and who's helping me learn how to unlearn those things has been really profound. And so that's something I would really encourage folks to, and to try, and you can find therapists. My therapist is Christian. You can find Christian therapists. You can find folks who speak your language language or who your same race and ethnicity who may understand your context but I think it's really powerful when there's a person who is just there to listen to you you have no obligation to who can objectively tell you like actually yeah that was really wrong and I'm sorry that happened let's process through that or like mm, you shouldn't have said that and let's process through why you said that you know and so I think it's really powerful for people and has helped me be much healthier I think in other aspects of my life um, so that's something that I would say you know, I also recognize that like there still may be barriers to accessing those mental health services. And so things that you can do, maybe if you can't access those kind of resources, is really think about safe ways to connect with community. I think the isolation is still a huge piece. And to also kind of create a coping plan. So it's really hard to when you're in a, a rough spot to think about what can I do that's healthy to bring me joy. 
but it's much easier to do that when you feel well. So thinking about what are healthy ways that I experience joy? How can I be intentional about incorporating that in joy? Like what am I noticing in my mind, my body, my emotions? Like how can I make sure that I'm well, right? What spiritual practice can I incorporate? What exercise can I incorporate? Those kinds of things, having a list kind of in your back pocket or really actually physically written down somewhere can be really good when you do hit a rough patch because we all we know that comes at some point or another and now you have a plan to make sure that you're well when it does happen well you know i I think i think that's really um powerful to say that you should have um people around you and people in your life that can help you when it comes to dealing with your mental health and but but like you know anything else as you know the hardest thing to do is to get um particularly men um, to go to take care of their, their health uh, when, you know, either we don't feel nothing is wrong um, or it has to be something that's really painful in order to go to a doctor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and, and therapy, therapist and seeing a therapist is kind of like a really, you know, big chasm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you got to have, you know, just like you have a dentist or you have a, you know, your, your doctor that you have a therapist as well. Uh, you know that that's that's even more of a stretch for a lot of people. Totally. Um, so that's 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 something that I just really um, found uh, very interesting that you would say that that you just definitely need to have a, a therapist, just like you have an eye doctor or you have you know a cardiologist or just a regular pre- you know inpatient doctor. So that was great. Uh, now I just also want to ask you, um, well, how how might churches or the church um, be an instrument in a organization, a ministry of support to our public health. Uh, We know that there's a lot of um, concerns now where COVID has really exposed the -hmm. fact that, you know, someone is really, really in danger if they've had pre-existing conditions or if they're just subject to obesity. Yep. Um, or diabetes. Um, and as we're seeing in our, our communities, there's a lot of health disparities. There's a lot of things. So how, how might churches get involved in really being a part of the solution to really help people during this uh, just changing times? Yeah, so I think um, my grad work was actually working with what we call third spaces. So um, these are places that people choose to go that are part of like their everyday experiences that aren't their homes, that aren't their jobs, these other places that we go where we experience joy, we experience community. And churches are those really strategic third spaces, I think, in public health work. Most folks trust their pastor more than their doctor. Right. They talk to their pastor or their deacon or their elder more than they talk to their doctor. Right. And there's many reasons for that. But I think churches are really great places to dispense accurate information. Right. And to dispel things that aren't true. Um, It's kind of it's always so surprising some of the things that folks say to me about um, diabetes or hypertension. Like, oh, it's just sugar. And it's like, well, actually, diabetes is much more than just high sugar and the way that it affects your body. And so I think churches are really key place that people go where they trust what they hear and sharing accurate health information is really powerful sharing those resources that folks need are really powerful Um, and then helping people I think something that churches can uniquely do that other spaces can't do is that churches provide really healthy prophetic and spiritual context to what's happening in the world right and that's things that doctors tend not to be able to do public health professionals that's not part of the work that we do but churches do that work and that's really grounding for people to have that kind of perspective so even in Sunday sermon talking about we're in a sifting season having us understand that this is a hard season but that actually God could be doing something powerful in us or in our community is really grounding and really helpful way for people to reframe an experience that they're having or see that God could be moving in in beautiful ways. And so I think that's something that churches should continue to do. But I think specifically in COVID, right, people are very thirsty for community and connection, and people are thirsty for hope and security and peace and 
we know the author of those things, right? And so I think churches actually have um, a really beautiful and powerful opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus right now. There are folks who have very physical needs, right? They need housing, they need food, but people actually really have community needs right now. The isolation, I think, is, is really, the more I talk to folks and think about myself, the isolation is really difficult. And churches know, like, we have a model of what healthy and beautiful and restorative community can look like. And so I really think that churches should be very intentional about the ways that they are seeking to foster community, not just in-house, but other people. Because I think that need right now, that that need is really starting to weigh heavy. The burden of that need is starting to weigh really heavy. Um, and I think as winter comes, it's going to start to weigh even heavier on folks. And so that's something that I think is a really beautiful opportunity that we have because folks need community regardless if you're in a pandemic or not. But here's a really beautiful opportunity where folks are really hungry for it and are looking for it. And so that's definitely something that I feel like churches can do. And that continues to kind of create these spaces where you can share accurate information, where, where you can you can teach and help people understand that their body is connected to their spiritual practice, right? That God desires you to be healthy and well and to flourish in your body, just like he would in your in your spiritual life, in your physical life, in your other lives. And so those are things are things that those are things that I think about a lot is that the church has this really unique opportunity to help foster really healing and restorative community um, right now. Well, uh, are there any resources, and that was great, it, it, you know, when it comes to the church, are, are there any resources that would help the viewers, help the listeners, help us when it comes to public health and finding information that's, that can really help us in, you know, we're COVID-19 today, who knows mm -hmm. what's going on tomorrow, uh, with our families, our personal, to keep, our, keep ourselves healthy. Do you have like any resources Oh, wow, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, so I think in terms of something, uh, I am someone who checks the Department of Public Health um, website a lot to see um, where COVID-19 numbers are. So I think for a while, Massachusetts has done pretty well. Um, and I think Gover Governor Baker has been very aggressive on the COVID-19 response. And I think it's been, it's really critical, I think, in protecting people's health, our economy, all sorts of, of, of parts of our society. So the DPH website is something that I would think about a lot. I would say about DPH as well is they are connected to lots of other um, resources that are community specific. So if folks are in Springfield or Worcester or on the Cape, there are still there are resources specific to those communities. So I think um, now you're making me think about some other things. Um, I always want to encourage folks to access um, mental health resources, to access physical needs resources, and I, and even your department, your department of public health, or whatever your statewide um, government for health looks like, differs from state to state. So I would encourage folks to think to seek out the information from their state, wherever they may be, or their country, wherever they may be. Um, but I do, I actually would need to spend some time thinking about some good mental health resources. I think the hard thing about resource access is that it can overwhelm folks or um, it, they can be quickly outdated. But what I would say is, um, I would say if there are folks in your community that you trust, who have good resources, who are connected to your, the community that you're housed in, to, to look to those folks first. And then I can think about some, maybe some national resources and some Massachusetts-specific places that I'd recommend. Um, but what I find and what I've done in my community work is the folks on the ground know better than I do the quality of the programming and the quality of the resources because they are the ones that have used them already. And I really trust their, um, their opinion on that. And so if there are folks in your network and your community who have access resources or have used resources that are, that you need, those are actually the people that I would go to first because they'll actually know how effective those resources are for your area. Thank you. Um, so if you, have, you if you also know any other resources that will come to mind, I will share them. Share and we can post it on the website. Totally. Um, because we're always going to do our best to help people with, with holistic discipleship. And that's really what we're all about at Abundant Life is holistic discipleship. And we do have... Um, you know, CDC and all the other um, organizations that are listed on the website so people can consult that information uh, if they need to. Mm -hmm. So we thank you for that. Um, I think this might be the last question. Okay. Well, being a woman of faith, 
being a woman of faith, being a believer, um, as you take your faith to work every day and you, you see the, you know, the different um, crisis that's going on when it comes to public health, the decisions that are being made, how, how does your faith integrate in your work? Yeah, that's a great. So I think for me, my faith is the reason why I do the work that I do. Um, my like personal life mission is to raise a generation of healthy children. So I actually really want to see the next generation of children like really thrive in their health. Um, and I, I have a particular burden really for, for black children and black birthing people or black mothers to really um, have healthy pregnancy outcomes and for children to really fall, like really thrive in those first five years of life. Um, and so that really has fueled the why for me, like, why am I interested in this work? How does, every project I do connect to seeing healthy young people develop. Um, and I think what's actually very interesting, I actually work with a lot of people of faith, a lot of Catholic people, especially who are also in the work because they have a particular burden for seeing people to be healthy. Um, and I feel like what public health has actually done for me, it's really expanded how I see people, right? So if, I, if I'm honest, right, like I, I was a person who saw folks with addiction differently, uh, differently than a mother, right, or, or someone who was homeless differently. I wouldn't want to say that out loud, right, but that was really my heart posture. Um, and working in public health has really shifted very practically how um, I see people. And so I think I've really learned that really from working with folks who do work with folks with substance use disorder or who are in recovery. And they were really adamant about using language that honored people, right? And so they said to me, we don't ever say addict, we say person with addiction. We don't say um, a relapse, we say a setback because all the work that they did before, that counts, not significant. Um, and the work they talk about a lot is saying, well, how do we make sure that someone with substance disorder who's living on a street and who's using regular, regularly has access to the best health care that they can, regardless of the decision that they're making, regardless of what they believe, because inherently that person is valuable. And so we want to make sure that they have access to the best care possible simply because they are inherently valuable. Um, and so that has actually been really profound for me to really rethink how I see people. Do I believe every person is inherently valuable? Because if I do, then I wanna make sure that person has the best access to care, that person can thrive and be the person that God has called them to be, regardless of what decision they make or do not make, regardless if I agree or don't agree with what they're doing, right? And so I think, um, Public health has helped me to look at people in a way that I think that, that that reflects the way that God looks at people. And it's helped me think very critically about, so what do we have to do in the place that we live to make that happen, right? So how do we advocate for new policies or structures or resources or programs that actually support people well, that honor people well, so that person has the opportunity to be all that God would have them to be, um, and so I think that for me is really exciting, especially when I see young people flourish. I get super excited because um, I know that's what God, God desires the best for this person, right? And so to be a part of the process of, of helping to create that space or create structures that support someone is really powerful for me and um, helps me think I'm doing the work that God's asked me to do to honor people well, to make sure they can flourish. Well. Wow. That's great. You're doing a fantastic job. I know we, we've done some, some work with you and you recruited uh, Darlene and some of the other uh, folks that are in the church and young people as well to get involved in All Flavors. And uh, just tell somebody quick, tell us quick about the All Flavors because I'm not sure if the viewers know yeah. uh, about what we're involved in as a church when it comes to All Flavors. Totally. I will say we still talk about ALC probably on a weekly basis and how much they loved working with you all. And Valentino has also become very popular. Um, but so Fly All Flavors really was a um, was a community mobilization movement. So here in Massachusetts, we were um, mobilizing to pass uh, a statewide restriction for the sale of flavored tobacco products. And that passed with the help of folks like from ALC and other folks around 
the, uh, around the state and around the city. Uh, but we were really able to work with ALC folks and helping train folks and for them to understand the history of the tobacco policy and why it's so significant. And then y'all were really powerful in mobilizing and sharing that information out and helping people to support this policy change. And Massachusetts is the first state to do that. And there are several states who have asked, well, how did you all do this work? And we keep saying we worked with really powerful community partners who had communities that trusted them and were able to really express why this was important. And so this has been, that's been actually my favorite project, I think, because I loved working with ALC and I loved, um, I love being able for the rest of my colleagues to see the great work that y'all were doing and how powerful it is to make those kind of community connections. So I'm sure they'll be hoping to connect with you all again very soon. That's great. I'm glad we could be a service. I, I was excited about the project and excited about really helping um, in, in the health of, of our community and, and doing more um, and doing more to really see that our communities flourish. Uh, so I, I want to thank you so much, uh, Lauren, for really um, doing such a good good work in the area of public health and informing us and coming on today at, uh, at uh, BLA Live to really share about this um, connection and how we should think about COVID. And uh, for those of you who are, are listening, uh, we just want you to make sure that you really are listening to, to the, the voices, the right voices. If you have questions, you know, you can, you can write us, we can connect you with Lauren and connect you with, with resources. And um, certainly we want you to be healthy, we want you to be safe in this season. It's gonna be a little bit of, I think it's gonna be a little bit longer than we thought. Um, so we, we just need to stay together and write it out. And I know God has some, some uh, wonderful plans ahead. And so we're gonna learn a lot, we're gonna grow a lot. And uh, we want to, you to know that we do care about your health and care about your family, and care about your, your soul. And uh, so thank you, Lauren, I, I appreciate your work. So I'm gonna pray and I'm going to uh, say goodbye to our, to our viewers and, uh, and may God rich, richly bless you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for each and every person that's listening to this uh, wonderful session that we've had with Lauren around uh, public health and COVID, Lord. We, we just pray that, Father, that you meet each and every person at the point in need. I pray, Lord, that something was said, that God, that you would uh, minister to their hearts, minister to their families. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you will bless your people May you keep your people. May your face shine upon your people. May God, you be gracious to them. Give them, oh God, your shalom, your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. But thank you, and uh, God bless. And we're so so excited that we were able to have you on Be La Live. All right? Thank you. God bless everybody. See you next week. And you'll be excited to know next week's guest. And you just got to tune into the worship service on this coming Sunday. And we'll tell you who that guest is. God bless you. Take care now. Bye-bye.